Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. And I know this is a strange place to start when we're looking at the book of Acts, but I want you to turn with me to, Act, or to Deuteronomy chapter 14, beginning in verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 2, to begin with this morning. I want you to know that my introduction today is probably longer than my message today. There are some things I really want to share with you, and a lot of this, again, will be things that we looked at in our Men for Christ rally, some of the different thoughts. But you've heard me say this many times, that God never designed us to be independent. There is such a huge desire in people to make their own plans, to go their own direction, to have their own things, to be independent. God created us to abide in Him. And in that, without Him, we can do nothing. But if you abide in Me and My words abide in you, you shall ask what you will be done unto you. God expects us, therefore, to have this relationship with Him where we are in this vine, we are branches, and as a branch in the vine, we can bear much fruit. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, no more can ye except ye abide in me, he says. The problem again in the 21st century, as has been the problem in all of history, has been man's desire to separate himself from God, to not be accountable to a God, to not have to worry about God's judgment. And therefore man has created this idea in his mind that he himself can be classified as a God and that man can make his own decisions, plan his own destiny, come up with his own potential on his own. Secondly, I want you to also to know that there is a growing tendency within people to be independent from people. God never designed us to be independent from others. The church is all about a connection of a body, a singular body, with many members in one body. God does not want us to forsake the assembling of ourselves together because we are not independent people. But in the world that we live in, everything is about independence. We don't have to call our neighbor on the phone anymore and ask for two eggs or a cup of flour. When was the last time you did that? In the old days, in ages past, rather than run to the store for an egg, you would call your neighbor and your neighbor said, Sure, I have an egg for you. Come on over and I'll give you an egg or a cup of flour. And you'll be able to do your work with your neighbor's help. If you had a car problem, you would not consult the internet. You would not look on YouTube to find the answer. There would be some person that you would be connected to that you could say, could you help me? And they would say, I'd be glad to help you. I'll be right over. That is no longer the case in society. People today are very independent, but in the church of God, in the church of Jesus Christ, there is something different about a church. God has designed this church to show to the world something that is very unique, something that's very peculiar. We cannot afford to become like the world and be independent-minded where we do not need each other. And again, part of the problem that you have here is people don't see the need to come to church. They don't see the need to come but once a year at Christmas or maybe twice a year at Christmas and Easter. They don't see the need to come on Wednesday night or Sunday night because we don't need people. We don't need what the people have to offer. We don't need their gifts, and we don't need to use our gifts to minister to them, which is very contrary to what God in the Bible says. And we live like we believe the Bible, at least we say we believe it, but we live very contrary to it in our practice. Now again, in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 2, very interesting verse, 
He says, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself, above all the nations that are upon the earth. Now please, this is sandwiched between dietary laws, what you should and should not eat. It's sandwiched between cutting yourself, making yourself bald for people, for the dead, and in, the prom- in, in, in these ideas of what the heathen do, I want you to understand that you're not like them. I didn't create you to be like the world. I do not want you to be like the world. You are peculiar unto me. You are special unto me. Again, when you say the word peculiar to this world, the world looks at peculiar as being odd, being outside of the mainstream, being different, being strange, being weird, not espousing the ideals of the norm. But when God looks at the word peculiar, the word peculiar in the Bible is a whole lot different than the word peculiar is in English language. The word peculiar means a treasure. And again, these are the ways it's used in the authorized version of the King James. Peculiar, special, jewel. That is the word segala in the Hebrew, the word that's used in this passage for peculiar. God sees us as being something very precious to Him. Now again, you find several illustrations in the New Testament about a woman who loses a coin. And that coin is not only valuable, it's necessary. And so she sweeps, she empties, she looks, and she seeks until she finds it. In other words, the idea is, I'm not giving up on that coin. I know I have nine more like it, but I am not going to stop looking until I find that one. And he talks about 100 sheep. And I've shared with you before that 99% is a very high percentage. You've only lost 1%. 1% is not a major amount to lose because you still have 99. But that's not the way the shepherd looks at it. The shepherd to him, that one, is more important to him at that point than the 99 that are found. He will leave the 99 with a keeper. And he will go tromping, trudging through the wilderness, the Bible says, until he find it. He's not going to give up because to him that is really important. And again, I want you to understand that in our world, church is all about numbers. Church is all about numbers. Success in a church is how big and how much bigger you are this year than last year. That's what this world is about. One of the big church gurus I was listening to one time talked about the 9,000 members in his church And he says, we don't always stay at that. Sometimes we go up, sometimes we go down. Some year we lose a thousand members, and we don't know exactly why, but the next year we'll gain another thousand members. And I'm thinking, lose a thousand members? A thousand members, you lose a thousand members. How can you lose a thousand members? He doesn't know why. Man, we lost an airplane. (laughs) Search 5,000 square miles to try to find the airplane. Lose 1,000 members. Understand, Jesus Christ does not seem to, a, to, to have that same thought when it comes to the people in the church. I, I really enjoyed this. Bernie Augsburger is a really good friend of mine. And I enjoyed Bernie. I was sitting in a class of his at Men for Christ. And Bernie said this. He said, I got alone with my son Mike. This is Bernie's words. And he said, Mike, I want you to understand, it's not about numbers. It's not about growth of the church. It's about growth in people. He says, understand, nothing else matters except this one question. Have you passed it on to the next generation? Nothing else matters. You have to pass this on to the next generation. You can imagine the pearl of great price. There's a huge difference between pearls that are artificial and pearls that are real. Especially if they're very cheap imitations or very cheap plastic. A little kid's set of, of necklaces that you get at the, at the dime store or, in, or the drug store or whatever. In our day, they were, it was called the dime store. I don't think you have dime stores anymore. 
In our day, it was a dime store. But if you had a set of these real cheap necklace that was imitation pearls, and you bent over and it fell off and it went in, a, in some paint, you would not be too concerned about the paint on the necklace. If you rinsed it off, that's fine. But if you had a very expensive, real pearl necklace, and these are very expensive pearls, and you bend over and that falls in some paint, you are painstakingly going to take effort to clean them completely. And again, the Bible says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify to himself a peculiar people. God is painstakingly taking the time to clean us completely because of the value that he finds within us trying to find a people that is zealous of good works. Now the word peculiar in this passage, Amy and Pera, Pera Amy, now Pera meaning above, Amy being I am, it just simply means the word peculiar, I am above. Now I understand if you look at the Greek lexicon, this is what it says, that which one's own, belonging to one's possession, a people selected by God. But I understand, but understand the etymology of this word when it comes from the actual Greek, Amy is the word for I am. And the word para is a, is a, 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 a preposition, uh, a prefix that's put on words, and it simply means, well, it means around, concerning, but it also means above. Now that goes along with what the Old Testament says, above all the nations that are upon the earth. God is not making you like them. He's making you far above them. There are some things about you that will never be like the world. I talk about a new car smell. We all feel this way. You get in a new car, and don't you love the smell of new leather or, or new upholstery? It smells so good in there. You get this old beater. My car is a 1997, and it has rust. And when I go through tar, I don't worry about it. If a piece of chunk of the fender falls off, I don't worry about it. You buy these fragrances called new car smell. I'm sorry, but it doesn't make the car smell new. <laughs> I don't care what you say. I put that in my car. It doesn't smell like a new car. <laughs> it does not have anything like that. But if you have a new car, if you do have something that has value <laughs> and it does smell new, oh, man, you want to retain that smell. You want to retain that feel. You want to retain that look as long as you can. I got a kick out of the other day. I saw this guy on, on, on the news. He passed away, and in his garage, they found a 1969 Shelby GT500 that had never been washed. <laughs> never been washed. Since the time it was new, the guy did not believe in washing it. He did not want to have any rush of rough abrasives on it. <laughs> it had a half inch of dirt on this 1969 it had 8,000 actual miles on the Shelby GT500. <laughs> like, what a waste. What a waste to buy that car and let it sit for all that time in a garage. Anyway, someone might enjoy it someday. <laughs> Who knows? Listen to the verse here, Titus 2.13. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of, our, of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might purify unto himself or that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all longsuffering, with all authority, let no man despise thee. Please understand that the word peculiar is what the blessed hope is all about. That's what the verse is about. It's what the death of Christ is all about. It's what all of our teaching is all about, that God has designed us, depended upon him, depended upon each other, to be very unusual in this world, to be very peculiar. Everyone in this church needs to be peculiar. Because the thought of peculiar is not odd. The thought of peculiar is above. And God has created you to be above. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Now let me break that down. There are four points real quickly. A chosen generation. Again, you have a 1971 Dodge Challenger here. 
One of my favorite cars when I was growing up was a Dodge Challenger. I went into Plaza Dodge and my dad was a good friend of the owner of Plaza Dodge and there was on the, 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 court, the floor room a 1971 Dodge Challenger RT with a 340 in it that he would sell me at cost for $3,200. I had a choice of either buying the Challenger or going to Bible college. <laughs> oh man, I struggled with that choice. Over the years, I've repaired and, and rebuilt cars, but that car there in that picture is not valuable for what it is. It's valuable for what it can become. There is huge potential in that car because of what it can become. Jesus Christ did not choose us based upon what we are. He sees in us, based upon his foreknowledge, he sees the potential that he can create when we are connected with him as a vessel. When he can control us, when he can fill us. There is incredible potential in what God can do and what God can do through us. He can change this vile body to be fashioned like his, his glorious body. We are a chosen generation. He has personally handpicked us based upon foreknowledge to be his instruments. And what has taken place in this church is not an accident that God has brought the people in this church together. God has brought you here for a particular purpose and a particular reason that you might be a vessel unto his glory, unto his honor. And there is nothing greater than being a vessel unto God's glory. When you talk about a royal priesthood, one of the tremendous blessings I told you about is connection. When he gave all of the tribes an inheritance to the tribe of Levi, Moses gave not an inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance. The priest's greatest blessing was not the priesthood. It was God himself. They were a special chosen vessel to be in a special connection with God himself. To be a priest, to be able to take man's needs before God. But he doesn't just stop at the fact that they're a priest, that they have God for their inheritance. He goes on and says, but you're a royal priesthood. He hath made us kings and priests unto God. And he says it twice. He has made us unto our God kings and priests. And these verses are not talking about the Jews. These verses in Revelation 5 and Revelation 1 are talking about the church. The first five chapters of Revelation are all about the church. Then you begin to understand about the Jewish people in the tribulation period. But in the beginning of this chapter, Revelation 1 through chapter 5 is all about the church. And God has made us kings and priests. He is the king of kings. He is the great high priest. What does it mean that we're kings and priests? It means we're connected to the king of kings. It means we're connected to the high priest. And that God himself is our inheritance. The Bible says we're a holy nation. And again, this is the, the greatest dilemma in this message that is all about introduction and nothing about my substance yet. And I will get to the book of Acts in a minute. But I felt that this was so critically important. That God says we're a holy nation. And again, the problem is we're not holy. And God wants us to see us being different. He wants the world to look at us and say, why are you different? Every man that asks you the reason of hope that's in you with meekness and fear, and they say, why are you happy? What makes you so different? But of course, the dilemma is if we're not different, they're not, not going to ask us why we are different. If we're not happy, they're not going to ask us why we are happy. If we're miserable with our life, miserable with having to be in church, miserable with our calling, miserable with our family, we have nothing to offer people. 
And God has placed us in a situation above everyone so they can look to us, and as they look up, they can see God who is above us. He's put us in that situation that people would see a difference. When it comes to our prayer life, listen to what it says here, Matthew 7, 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father in heaven good give, give good things to them that ask Him? Okay, this is understand about God and His children. It's not so much about us as it is about God here. If we understand that God is the kind of God that loves to give good things to those that ask Him, And the world ought to be able to see in us, you know, that church there, Calvary Baptist Church, I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they seem to get what they ask for. They pray for things, and God answers their prayers. I don't understand it, but that group of people, God answers their prayers. God answers their prayers. Where do you see that on this earth? If you could see a group of people, and of course it does seem to say that God wants to answer that prayer. It does seem to say that God wants to give things to us. If you saw a group of people that God actually answered their prayers, would you want to go to them if you had a prayer need? You would really be zealous of that group of people. Boy, that gal in my church up in Duluth, that prayer warrior, Mary Clausen. She had strangers calling her from 50 states saying, I understand that you are a prayer warrior. I have a great need. Would you pray for me? And Mary would never fail to pray for that need. Listen to the sad commentary of the holy nation. You lust, you have not, you kill, you desire to have, you can't obtain, you fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. What a sad commentary of the holy nation that God has placed us as a nation above all the other people on this earth. If I could get that group of people to understand prayer, God says, if I could get them to pray and ask me so I could give to them so the world could see something unique about them in their prayer life, in their prayer ministry, I could make a difference in this world. But the average church member doesn't pray. And the average church doesn't have because they don't pray. They have not because they ask not. And God wants us to give. He wants us to ask so that He can, as a good father, give good things to His children so the world can see in us something different. It's not so we can hoard it. It's not so we can consume it upon our lusts. That's not the point of this. Can you imagine if everyone in this church was constantly praying for wisdom? What would the world see about Calvary Baptist Church if we were constantly praying for wisdom? If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. Would he give it to us? Would he give us wisdom? What would happen if we had a whole church full of wise people? Would that make a difference? The Bible says... Prayer is intercession and giving of thanks be made for all men who will have all men to be saved. 1 Timothy 2.4 And come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants us to pray so that people would be saved. Paul says, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is so they might be saved. What would happen if we had a church full of people who prayed for unsaved people regularly, consistently, with fervency, with passion? What would happen? What would the world see in Calvary Baptist Church? Now again, I mentioned this in the very start of this message. The longer I preach here, the more unlikely it seems I'll get to my message today. <laughs> I may not ever get to the book of Acts today the longer we go through this, but still an introduction here. When it comes to showing love to one another, the Bible says this, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. Okay? Now, it, it seems to me a no-brainer that if one of the ways the world's going to see that we belong to Jesus Christ, we're connected to Him, we have a connection with God as if we have loved one for another. God wants the world to see that we have 
something unique. We belong to Christ because we have loved one for another. They can know that. They can see that. Friends, if we do not have a desire to be around our brothers, if we do not have a desire to be connected to our brothers in Christ, then we have no opportunity to show love to them. It is one of the most frustrating parts of being a grandpa. (laughs) If you've got a grandchild that lives five hours away and you can't go to her and see her and show that love to her, yeah, you can send her a gift or a present. But if you really want to show love to your granddaughter, you need to be with her. You need to be spending time with her. You agree with that? If that be the case, the Bible says, you are a peculiar, ye are a peculiar people. Ye, plural, are a singular peculiar people. What does that mean? You, plural, are a peculiar people, singular. Now, he doesn't have to word the indefinite, use the indefinite article A here in this passage. He doesn't have to use that, but this is a singular noun. Now, the word in English, people, that's always singular. People can be singular or plural. You still say people, but that's not what it is in Greek. We're not talking about peculiar peoples, plural, persons, plural. We're talking about a singular people that are ye. Which means that God did design us to come together and be together Because we are a body of Christ. He designed that. And He designed us to be dependent upon one another. That I need you and you do, whether you know it or not, need me. I need your gifts in my life and you need my gifts in your life. That's just the way it is. It's the way God designed the church. But we have people, of course, in the 21st century that do not want to have any need... And so they go to church so they can sit in the back row, so they can sit in the pew and get in and get out without any, anyone noticing them, talking to them. They are around church, they're around God, they can sing praises, they can leave. But not only are we dependent upon God, but I need you to understand clearly, crystal clear, that we are dependent upon one another. And it's the way God designed this world, this church this peculiar people that we as he's created the body of Christ with God as the head with we are which with which we which makes us members of that one head who gives us the direction gives us the purpose gives us the reason for what we're doing the message that we're talking about today is am i mad for believing in Christ in the book of acts And again, we're not going to really get into that message right now. We'll do that next week. But I just want you to understand that Festus said to Paul, Paul, much learning doth make you mad. (laughs) You're a madman, Paul. You are weird. You are strange. You're mad. And Paul said to Festus, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but I speak the words of truth. The greatest blessing in my life was when I came to know Jesus Christ as Savior. And being able to have a relationship with that God who died upon the cross for me, the Father in heaven and His his Son is precious to me because I'm precious to Him. Being a pastor of a church is precious to me because I have brothers and sisters in Christ. We are not in the progress or in the position or the the work of building a church. We are in the business of building people. And the way we build people is through the Word of God by being connected one with another. I want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. 
Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask Him that He might be your Savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, and that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.